Welcome to Keep What You Earn, your judgment and jargon-free zone for entrepreneurs of all levels. Get ready to learn how to scale your business, save money in taxes, and create a business that grows your wealth. If it feels like the financial side of business is like eating your vegetables, well then think of this podcast as the ranch dressing to make the process a little more enjoyable. My name is Shannon Weinstein. I'm a CPA and business owner on a mission to simplify money and empower others through knowledge. I hope this episode inspires you to take action, but remember that the information we share is for educational purposes only and is not individual tax advice. Now that we got that out of the way, let's start the show. Now, I love welcoming other CPAs onto our show, other enrolled agents, CPAs, tax pros, tax experts, anyone willing to share their knowledge. And I especially love welcoming onto the show folks who have influenced or inspired me as a CPA, somebody I learned from, someone whose books I've read, and someone who honestly inspires me to really think outside of the box when it comes to tax strategies. And I'm really excited to welcome on the show today, Tom Wheelwright. So Tom is a tax and wealth expert. He is a CPA. He's a CEO of WealthAbility, Rich Dad Advisor, entrepreneur, international speaker, the best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth, How to Build Massive Wealth by Permanently Reducing Your Taxes. And he recently released his new book entitled The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. Wheelwright is the CPA for Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he's spoken on stage in every continent to over 100,000 entrepreneurs, small business owners, and investors. He's also the host of two popular podcasts, The WealthAbility Show and The WealthAbility for CPA Show. Now, what I love about Tom is he is dedicated to not only empowering entrepreneurs like you with more knowledge about how to save money in taxes, but he's also passionate about helping elevate the profession, something I'm immensely passionate about, where we can expect better out of our CPAs, where we can have better professionals and in turn, better clients and a better life for everybody. His goal is to help people achieve their financial dreams faster by permanently and legally reducing their taxes. Wheelwright is a contributor to Entrepreneur Magazine and his work has been seen in Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and on Fox and Friends. And he has been featured in so many different outlets. He has been such an influencer in the accounting space in the best way possible. And what I love about Tom is that he really has, he takes everything so unapologetically when it comes to his perspective on taxes. He's been around, he's seen it, he has the experience to back it up. And he can absolutely teach you something no matter if you are new to the game in taxes, or you've been around for a while. He's just a great guy to have a conversation with when it comes to anything related to tax law, tax strategy, and uh, entrepreneurship. So like me, he is also an entrepreneurial CPA as well. And I know you're going to love this conversation. So let's get it started. Hey, Tom. So happy to have you on the show today. Happy to be with you, Shannon. Absolutely. So could you just tell our audience a bit more about you and how you became an accountant? Because I love a good accountant origin story. There's there's always a story because it's never on purpose. (laughs) Well, mine was very on purpose. So my biggest influence in my life was my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, She's a very um, extraordinarily intelligent woman who was uh, very much ahead of her time. And she um, was the controller for my father's print shop. And all the kids, I was the youngest of six, all of us worked at the print printing company. It was a fairly sizable endeavor. And uh, I worked in the accounting department. So I just like numbers. I've always liked numbers. Numbers are easy. Um, I've always found numbers to be pretty easy. So um, I liked doing it. I liked working uh, for my mother. She was actually a really good boss. And that's that was that was the very beginning was it really I was a mama's boy. I love that too. That's a similar story to me and my dad. Absolutely. So how did you get into tell me a bit more about your career? So, you know, did you did you do the the you know, the bigger firms? Did you work in corporate? How did you decide who you wanted to work with or what your mission was going to be? You know, I, I, I did all of that. So I started I, at a master's of tax from the University of Texas. I started at Ernst and Young went back when it was Ernst and Winnie. Mm-hmm. And I spent three years in their national tax office in Washington, D.C. So I was with like the best and the brightest back there. And um, I did that for about seven years. And then I went in-house just as a really a lifestyle change. I went in-house as the tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company and did that for four years. 
uh, went back into public accounting. Um, that was not a very positive experience. Um, it was another big, another big four firm. And uh, we uh, disengaged with each other in not a pleasant way. And so I had an opportunity. I had, uh, they'd actually given me a big severance um, because they had, they'd done some things that were not great. And, um, and so I thought, well, this is the chance. So time to start my business. And I just, I just looked at other people. I'm going, oh, you know, these people have their own firms. They're driving nicer cars than I am. And it's, if they can do it, I can do it. And so I started my first firm in 1995 and I had two clients. I went out and I literally knocked on doors and uh, did it the hard way for the first nine months and finally figured out that really what you have to do is go acquire a CPA firm, that it's cheap to acquire a CPA firm. So I did that and then we were off and running. So, um, but I always liked what I liked at ENY. When I was there, we still served, uh, Big Four still served a lot of entrepreneurs. And I'm the son, grandson, and great grandson of entrepreneurs. And I just love entrepreneurs. I don't like big companies. You know, I worked for the big company for four years. I'm just going, just, I, I'm, I have no passion for that. And so I started, when I started my firm, it was very intentional with the idea of serving solely entrepreneurs and really bringing them a very high level of tax expertise that they have, were not able to get otherwise. I, I completely agree. I think that there's very little, well, there's very little tax education it's not like entrepreneurs get a, get a brochure or a pamphlet, like an orientation, like, welcome to being a business owner. Here are the things you need to know. It's unfortunately a lot of trial by error and a lot of making mistakes that cost you money and then getting to kind of figure out how it's all supposed to work. But the professional help that, that they really need feels out of touch, especially for early stage business owners. So what I appreciate is I think you've taken also an educational angle because I know you have several books out and you have other material that you're using to really teach entrepreneurs how to be more tax savvy. And uh, can you speak a little bit about like your passion for the education side as well? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think more educated clients make for better clients. And, and I think people deserve the education. You know, the, the, there's a lot of talk about the rich don't pay tax and well, they have, they have very expensive tax advisors, right? And that's yeah. why they don't, that's why they don't pay tax. Um, and, and the average entrepreneur can't afford that. But the thing is, is that, you know, a tax advisor really can't reduce your taxes. They can only tell you what you need to do to reduce your taxes. So I wrote Tax-Free Wealth as that pamphlet, basically. That pamphlet right. every business owner should have that is, here's, here's the rules that you need to follow in order to reduce your taxes. This is the way the tax law actually works. It's not what you've been told. And, um, and, and so I'm all about education. All we do is the more we can educate, the better we can serve. And the more people we can serve, the more effective we become. And what would you say to those maybe naysayers around tax-free wealth that say, well, I'm proud to parent pay my fair share of taxes, or I'm proud to pay more taxes because, you know, I, I want to be a responsible citizen. I want to be patriotic, if you will, and, and chip in. I want to do my part towards paying towards the government's uh, tax bill. You know, why, why would you agree or disagree with that type of approach? Well, I would challenge, I, I challenge everybody. I've, I've had those people on my podcast and I challenge them. You know, there's a box. First of all, have you not taken your mortgage interest expense deduction? And it, well, if you did, why did you? Well, you know, renters don't get that. So why are you taking it? You know, back in the day when we had personal exemptions, did you take your personal exemptions? Are you taking your, your deduction for taxes, for charitable contributions? Why would you do that if your belief is that the more taxes we pay, the more patriotic we are? Why aren't you paying more taxes voluntarily? And nobody does that because that's not realistic. The reality is I, I had somebody on my show that he was all about millionaires paying more tax. And I said, so, you know, there's a box you can mark, right, to contribute to the Treasury. I said, do you mark that box? Do you pay more taxes? No, I'm not going to do it if everybody else doesn't have to do it. And I'm going, OK, so that's the problem, right? So these aren't and, and understand that while we don't have an obligation to reduce our taxes, we do have the right to reduce our taxes. And, you know, there's a very famous saying from uh, Judge Learned Hand from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that said, basically, 
it's not patriotic to pay more taxes than you have to. I, I actually go the other side though, Shannon. I think it's remembering that first of all, that most tax breaks are incentives. They're not, they're not loopholes. And this is, mm -hmm. to me, this is the big fallacy is people talk about, oh, well, we need to close those loopholes. Well, yeah, you do need to close the loopholes, but giving a t credit for solar panels is not a loophole. That is an intentional benefit. And the reality is, if you believe that to be patriotic, you do things that the government wants you to do, if that's what's patriotic, well, the government wants you to put on solar panels. They want you to create jobs. They want you to create housing. And the reason we know that they want us to do that is because they give us tax incentives to do those things. So if you really look at, yes, um, you're absolutely right. We don't, we don't want to cheat on taxes. We don't want to do things that are immoral or illegal. Um, at the same time, if we really understood the tax law, we'd be doing all those things that the government, government incentivizes. And by doing those, we'd pay less tax, but we'd actually be more patriotic. I agree. And I think that there's there's also this blend of you want to be as strategic as possible around your taxes, pay no more than you legally have to pay. But also there's this kind of uh, tug of war game going on with, but I also don't want to be too aggressive. I don't want to invite an audit. I don't want to overdo it. Or what what is kind of your approach with clients or with even educating other professionals on that balance of, you know, the conservative and aggressive tax strategies or approaches or positions on a return? I have a different view of conservative and aggressive and what that means. I think conservative means doing something within how you understand the tax law. And so the less you understand, the smaller that window is. But the more you understand about the tax law, um, actually, it's when you do something that's outside of your understanding of the tax law that's aggressive. So the key is understand more about the tax law and have advisors who understand more about the tax law. And then you can actually be conservative and still get more tax benefits. So really it's a matter of knowledge and your level of understanding and your advisor's level of understanding. And that's what really gets you into the conservative versus aggressive. And what I find is people who call, I've had people, <laughs> I had somebody, I was teaching a class once and he, one of the participants had their CPA next to them. We actually overheard, one of my friends overheard the CPA and he turns to, to his client and he says, boy, this guy's really aggressive. And I'm going, and yet what I was saying was, I don't ever talk about anything that's aggressive. I'm always smack dab in the middle of the law. I just spent 40 plus years learning the law. And so I just thought, wow, that just shows that you don't understand the law if you think that's aggressive. And for him, it was aggressive. For me, it was conservative. So really, it's just, it, it's relative to your understanding of the law. It's not, one thing is by definition aggressive, and one thing is by definition conservative. I agree. And it's, uh, this is why it's so complicated for entrepreneurs and business owners to figure out who to get advice from, because they're, it's their risk tolerance, their understanding of the law, which of course is very small because they didn't study this. They didn't go to school for this stuff. So they're relying on professionals to be able to advise them properly. But it's really hard to decipher which professional is kind of in line with what I'm comfortable with, or am I getting the right advice? Where do you think professionals can do a better job at advising their clients when it comes to tax strategies and, and minimizing tax liability? Oh, I think we do a much better job educating our clients. I, I think most professionals, I, I call it the black box theory of uh, advisory services. You, you've got this box of all this knowledge you've learned over the years and you have, you really don't want to give that away because you feel like if you do, then they're not going to need you anymore. When in fact, the more educated they are, the more the more success they have and the more success they have, the more complicated they have, they get, the more complicated they get, the more business you get. So I, I think that's the, the big mistake um, that advisors make. But I really think most advisors are lazy. I really do. I, I hate to say that, but I really do. I think most advisors are lazy, um, whether it's a financial advisor, attorneys, accountants. I don't care who you're talking about. Most, most advisors are lazy. I actually believe that if your advisor cannot explain why they're doing something, you should run. Um, they should be able to explain it in language you can understand. And if they don't, if you don't understand what they're saying and they can't explain it in your terms, then you probably have the wrong advisor.
I agree. I've always taken the approach of, you know, accountants used to sell information, but now I can ask my, my office lamp <laughs> for information. Like I can ask right. my Google or my Alexa for information now chat GPT, right? So yep. information is no longer something you buy. It's, it's free and available. It's like what Napster did to music, like you in Spotify and yep. all these other things. It's, this is no longer a thing you have to pay for. What they're paying for is the implementation and the intention of what exactly am I going to do with this information? How do I use this to better my life and better my business? And I think there's always going to be a place for advisors to infuse that humanity into it and to talk through it and to actually educate. And I think that that has been a disruption in the accounting industry over time is that we're switching this kind of mentality and almost the skill set of what it takes to be a successful accountant from a, a, you know, a black box of information to being able to actually communicate and teach. Yeah. I think it's time we go from accountant to advisor. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's the big switch. And, and really, I think you can tell a good advisor by the questions they ask. Um, the, uh, I think the job of an advisor is to ask good questions. Just like if you went to the doctor's office because you had a pain in your shoulder, uh, you would expect the doctor to ask you all sorts of questions in order to do that diagnosis that you wouldn't expect you to have to ask the doctor questions. And so many accountants expect their, their clients to ask them questions. That is not the client's job. That is your job as the advisor is to ask the questions. Their job is to answer the questions and then implement the advice that you give them. Your job is to ask them the right questions so that they can get the right advice. I 1000% agree. This is, uh, this is exactly the mentality we're trying to have now is like, how can we ask better questions to get the right information out of our clients to advise them properly? It's really a coaching relationship more than it is a service provider or somebody just crunching the numbers. Um, when it comes though to our business owners who are listening and they are looking for an advisor and they're looking to understand what makes a good advisor right? Like what are the, what would you say are the, the, the metrics they should possibly be using as opposed to say, well, Shannon got me a bigger refund than Tom did. So she must be better. Right. Or I got a bigger refund equals, you know, they're a better tax preparer, tax advisor. I see you smiling. So you know exactly where I'm going with that. Could you just elaborate on, you know, what makes a good advisor, what to look for and how to kind of measure that in a sense? Well, first of all, I have an entire chapter in tax-free wealth on how to find a good tax advisor, right. chapter 23. So I would always uh, send you there for more details. But I, I think there are certain qualities. And number one is the questions they ask you. That is for mm -hmm. sure, number one. Are they interested in you? Or are they interested in themselves? Okay. Um, uh, uh, number two is that it should be a partnership. It's not, you know, I think the one of the biggest fallacies is, my tax preparer handles my taxes. They can't. I'm the one who can tell you what facts you need to change to reduce your tax, but you have to change the facts and you have to decide, are you going to change the facts? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me and they said, well, you know, I read your book or I, I worked with one of your team and um, boy, it was all great advice. But, you know, I, I talked to this other CPA and they said, no, you shouldn't do that. And I'm going, well, if you don't do it, you can't get the benefit. So, you know, part of it is also, I think, finding a good fit for you, right? If, if you want somebody who is, you know, just going to prepare your tax return, that is different than finding somebody who's going to be a partner with you in reducing your taxes and building your wealth. I, I think that uh, you have to decide. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, as a client, I think clients have an obligation. And that is to take the advice because there's nothing we can do as advisors uh, except give the advice. We can't do it for you. So if you don't take the advice, frankly, you're being a terrible client and I wouldn't want you for a client. I, I've had those clients. I'm just going, well, we shouldn't be working together. So I do think you need to find the, the right fit for what you're looking for and uh, is this what I'm trying to accomplish? And does not my advisor want the same thing for me that I want for me? Yeah, I, I compare it to a nutritionist and I go, well, they can't eat the food for you. Like you got to exactly. go do it. You got to actually go do it if you want results. That's right. Uh, and a tr personal trainer can't do burpees for you, unfortunately. And no matter how much you try to outsource it, you can't. So I want to go through some, some tax myths because I love this. And I also love if you're not following Tom on social media, he's got some great content out there to help you dispel common myths. I think understanding or things that we understand about taxes, right? Number one, bigger refund is better. Do you agree? Disagree? 
Uh, I, I don't agree or disagree, actually. I, I know I, I know the standard line is if, if you're getting a refund, you're giving the government a, a, a an interest-free loan. I, mm-hmm. I get that. But I also understand that, I mean, particularly where you're not going to get a whole much much better result in the bank, right? And And for some people, it's forced savings. And for them, I think that they need the refund. I think this is a way... For them to have that, they depend on it for their annual vacation. They depend on it for putting money into their 401k or they, their HSA. That's where the money comes from is that refund. And and so I, I think for certain people, I actually think refunds are, are, are important to them. Other people, you know, like my clients, for example, none of my clients want a refund. They, they don't want to owe tax frankly, on April 15th, but they don't want a refund either. So what they want to do is pay the right amount of tax so that they've got the money available to them. But um, they they certainly don't want a surprise. And the last thing in the world anybody wants is is owing more than they're expecting. So while they may be okay owning as long as they know ahead of time, what you never want is uh, is a surprise. And I think that's actually the biggest pain point with most taxpayers is the unexpected part, the surprise part of the surprise tax bill, where if they had just known that this was coming the whole year and they kind of, it wasn't this kind of shock factor, then I feel like it's less impactful. But I think it's more stressful if you're only doing the annual tax preparation and seeing what your fate is and rolling the dice or shaking the magic eight ball and seeing, oh, I owe this much money. It, it just feels so disconnected all year. And then boom you know, you have this bill, but it doesn't have to be that way. Well, no, I mean, you know, tax planning should be done in January, February, March, April, all the way through December. And and too many people at the most, they might do some tax planning in November, December. Well, it's too late. Right. You're too late November, December to do tax planning. Um, but early in the year, like, you know, as, as we talk here, great time to do tax planning. Do tax planning while you're looking at doing your tax return for last year. I mean, those things should go together and, and rather than, than waiting. I, I, I think it's a huge mistake, you know, to wait until the end of the year because you're never going to know what's, what's really possible. I completely agree. And you want to, you have to be thinking about tax planning a little bit as a, as kind of a lens to look through in a lot of things you do. So as a business owner, you know, you're taking a trip. Is there a way that this is a business trip? You're, you know, engaging in certain activities, right? And you go, oh, that actually could be deductible or a portion of that could be deductible, but without the right, right advice, you're not really maximizing that. And that's really important. So Tom, what do you think, what would you recommend for entrepreneurs who feel like, I feel like I'm overpaying in taxes or I feel like I'm just paying way too much. And it just feels like a huge hit to me this tax season because we're right in the middle of tax season as we're talking and it's stressful. It's overwhelming. You know, what are some of your top tips to do two things, which is one, the mindset stuff, you know, getting through that and as well as the tactical, you know, how do we actually lower our tax bill? What should we be looking at and thinking about? Uh, Well, the mindset thing, I mean, that's, that's why I wrote, you know, tax-free wealth. That's why I wrote the, my new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, is, is to really shift that mindset because uh, you do have to do that. Um, it, we, we find that when people come to us uh, looking for help, it's um, because they've shifted their mind, that, that made that mind, mindset shift um, because you do have to do that first. Um, so I, I think that is um, by far number one. Um, but the other is, you know, get a second opinion, just like you would with a doctor you know, have somebody else, some other CPA or some other group like we do, you know, we always do that for prospective clients. We'll always uh, review their prior year tax return um, at at no charge because you want to get that second opinion so that, uh, you know, just get it, just get some comfort, just get some some comfort because you don't know. You're, you're, You're right. Most people have no idea whether they're overpaying their taxes. And I think a a big piece of that is almost the intentionality behind how confusing our tax code is, or at least how unapproachable it is to say the average citizen. I think it's well known that the average citizen doesn't know the intricacies of what they're taxed on, how they're taxed, or how that calculation really plays out. And unfortunately, we, you know, this is said all the time, but this is not taught in school. We learned about geometry and trigonometry and all these other things, but don't know how to read our own tax return. And uh, I think that's a, that's a shame, but I think that there's a bit of, well, that would cost the government a lot of money if we did that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Albert Einstein's quoted as saying that uh, the most difficult thing in the world to understand is the income tax. And that was back when the income tax was way simpler, right? 
It was way simpler in the 1950s than it is in the in the the 2020s. And um, I, you know what? I, I I think that the tax law is complicated. I think it's complicated just because they're they're trying to be perfect, and 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 so they're trying to. They're trying to avoid loopholes. Actually, I think the complexity comes from avoiding loopholes because you add complexity when you close off those loopholes. You're, you're, you have to have the wording. Remember, every word in the law counts and a judge will look at every single word, uh, every word, whether it's and or or, you know, l- little words matter. And so it, it's going to be complex. And But what I think is, is that I don't think the concepts are complex at all. I think the concepts are really simple. And that's... That's why I wrote um, my books is that, you know, it's really understand the concepts and then you're always going to, it's, it's okay to use an advisor because let's face it, um, business investing, they're team sports. You know, th- there's no reason that you have to understand all of it. You can hire people to do that. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not an expert in um, developing real estate. I don't want to be, but I know people who are, and if I want to invest in real estate development, I'm going to invest with them because they know what they're doing. I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, So I I think, you know, pick and choose, you know, when you get older, you're young enough, you're you're too young, young for this. But when you get older, you realize, you know what, your brain's kind of full and you don't really need to put new things in your brain because in order to put new things in your brain, you have to take things out of your brain because it's full. Mm -hmm. And so what, I, what I've realized after all those years is that I'm much better off letting somebody else do what they're good at. And I just need to understand, okay, how does it apply to me? And that's what I need to understand. Yeah. And I will say that like, I can kind of relate to that brain is full feeling. I think any accountant who lived through the 2020 tax law changes can relate. (laughs) Like no more changes. I'm done. We are closed for new tax law changes. For those of you listening, like I was like, give your accountant a hug after the last three years of what they've had to put up with. Because when the rule book changes in live time, guys. <laughs> Listen, so this this is something, and I agree with that. You know, there's been a lot of, we need to, you know, give healthcare workers a hug. And we really mm-hmm. need to, you know, and, and because they're the front line, yeah. right? They were the front line of this pandemic. But the front line from a financial side we're the CPAs. Um, we're the ones who help people through the PPP loans. We're the ones who, and, and most of us didn't charge for it. Mm-hmm. You know, we recognize, so I, my, my CPA firm didn't make a profit in 2020. Okay. And we usually make a really good profit, but we decided we're, this is our time to give back. So we gave back for the entire year. And you're right. We had five changes within two years five major tax law changes. And so I agree. I, I, I actually think CPAs were probably not appreciated. And while we love to be appreciated, you know, we, we really want everybody, we, we want our clients to be successful. And that's, that's really what's number one for us. Yeah. And, and the other part of it too, is that we were finding out in real time along with everybody else, what the PPP was offering and we were getting questions about it as experts. And I go, we have the same information (laughs) as you. We are not insiders of any sort. Like we, my husband was asking me and I go, I don't know what's the news today. Maybe we'll find out. (laughs) Like, it's just, it was, it was, we were all along for the ride together. And, um, I, I think the whole profession really stepped up to help small businesses recover and, uh, I don't think, I honestly don't think that gets recognized enough. We were actually joking, me and some friends saying, you know, Joe Biden, throw us a bone. Like, can we have like a tax yeah, no prepare? Kidding, right? Yeah. Like, can we have like a, <laughs> you know, if everyone, can we get like a, a tax break on paying for tax software after this that kept changing, <laughs> you know? There you so go. yeah. And, and ensuring everything was still reported and the IRS was plenty busy. That was, that was a, a rocky couple of years. And, and on along those lines, you know, every year this kind of happens, but I feel like since the pandemic has been especially prevalent is in tax season around this time of year, there's a lot of news that covers like we're actually in the news for once. Like we get our little 15 right. seconds of or 15 minutes of fame between February and April where people are seeing news stories about taxes or these recent things about like Republicans want to abolish the IRS or, you know, we want to get rid of this or get rid of that or, you know, revealing people's tax returns. And, you know, it becomes more of a subject that's being used to basically, I I would say, spin or to present a certain case Mm -hmm. in the media where like the rest of the year, no one cares. But what we're using like 
you know, different uh, news stories about taxes in the IRS, I think to kind of stir up the American citizens and kind of like, it's bringing them awareness, but I think there's a lot of misunderstandings on what actually is going on with tax law, with the enforcement. I, I would just love your take as an expert and someone who's who's done this for so many years. Like, what are you seeing now, maybe versus before, like what's changed, but also where do you see this going in terms of how the IRS is being used, how how the tax laws are being developed and I would just love more insight on on what's to come and and where are we right now in all of this? Like if, if we were to try to map that out. I, I don't know about you, but I'd sure like some accountability over how Politico got those 3,000 returns to mm. be released. I'd sure like the IRS to be accountable and they've not been. I agree. You know, during the pandemic, the IRS just said, well, you know, we're, we, we can't work. We, we, you know, we, we have all we're these problems. Busy. I mean, I, I'd listen to the IRS commissioner say, well, we're so oppressed. I'm just going, but we don't get time off as CPA. Yeah, we still have a deadline. <laughs> we still have deadlines. We still have, you know, so I, I, I don't understand. And, you know, this whole thing about, I don't know about you, I, I've had a lot of rich clients over the years. Mm -hmm. Not once have I seen one cheat. And I'm going, if you really believe the rich are cheating, then you are really saying that the CPA profession is either ignorant or complicit. And I'm really challenged with either one of those because mm -hmm. I find CPAs to be the most trustworthy of all financial advisors. And I find them to be some of the most intelligent of the, of the financial advisors. And they know their clients, they know what's going on with their clients inside and out for the most part. I think it's, um, I think it's a huge disservice. I, I wish the AICPA would speak up quite frankly. I wish the profession would be stronger about this and, and recognize that if you look at the statistics, you know, this whole, you know, with the, the new $80 billion, um, you look at, you, you know, they keep talking about, well, the rich don't pay their fair share of tax. Well, the rich pay all the taxes. Let's start there. Okay. You know, the, the lower 50% don't pay any tax. And so it's only, you know, most of the taxes are paid. We are how do we do have a progressive tax rate system and there is a lot of tax paid. Now, are there opportunities to improve the tax law? Absolutely. Are are there things that are in the tax law that allow the rich to avoid taxes? For sure. But we just know that they're there for everybody, not just the rich. The difference is the rich have better advisors, right? That's really what it is. They, they just know more. Um, but realize also that most of the, if you look statistically, most of the cheating happens in that middle income range in that hundred thousand, two hundred thousand $200,000 business. Anytime you get a contractor who says, I'll give you a discount for cash, you know, they're cheating. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a tax cheat right there. So I, I just think that the, the whole dialogue about the rich is a, it's, it's, is actually a sad dialogue that we've come to that where you're actually bad for being rich. I understand that. I, I do think that there's no question that um, wealth has become too concentrated at the higher income levels. And I have no question that the tax law plays a factor in that. Um, so that's fine, you know, but, but fix it without throwing legitimate tax behavior under the bus. And legitimate tax incentives. You know, on the one hand, you say the rich don't pay enough tax, and then you go give basically a sixty percent tax incentive for solar solar energy, right? I mean, it's effectively a sixty percent tax benefit. So you're only paying if you put solar solar panels on your on your business on your office building. You're really only paying for about a third of the cost of those panels. The government's paying for the rest of it. You go, well, why don't the rich pay tax? Well, well, maybe it's because the government put those tax incentives in there. And if you don't like that, you know, then, you know, petition the government to, to, to change the law. But the reality is no politician, I mean, let's be real, no politician's ever going to give up power mm -hmm. voluntarily. And the biggest power they have is the power of taxation. So, you know, this idea of, you know, abolishing the IRS or, or a flat tax or a, a national sales tax. Mm, we might get a national sales tax, but it'll be an additional tax, not an in lieu tax. And so, you know, we, we just have to, you know, let's be a little more practical about this, but let's look at what could we do right to make things so that, so the, the rich, um, so it's not so easy to avoid tax. Cause I, I do think it's pretty easy, frankly. I, I think, I think it's very easy. I, I, I wrote a book called tax-free wealth. It wasn't tax reduced wealth. It was tax-free wealth. 
Do you, do you truly believe that someone can live tax free? I have many clients who live tax free. So, and, and they're living tax free because they're doing what the government wants done. They're yeah. not living tax free because of loopholes. They're not do, living tax free because they're doing, you know, uh, you know, odd little off the book stuff. They're not cheating. They're literally doing what the government wants them to do. And they just do so much of it. You know, it's kind of, um, I always like to say the more income you earn, the more tax you pay, but the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. That is the way our system works. Now I get the system doesn't work perfectly, um, but that is the way the system works. So really the question is, are you doing, you know, are you understanding the tax law? Are you understanding what you can do to reduce your own taxes? And maybe we ought to take responsibility for ourselves instead of, you know, saying, well, somebody else should foot the bill. I completely agree. And there's a big difference between income and wealth and rich versus wealthy in some cases, right? Like, you know, you have to look at what behaviors are actually being incentivized. And instead of, to your point too, I agree with you on this, that, you know, to, to some extent you have to look at who's paying more in taxes and it's more like what incent or what behaviors are being incentivized. And is that what we want? And if that's the question we're asking, going, are we incentivizing the right behavior? I think that's a better question than who's actually paying more. It should just be around, well, why? And what is going on there? And for solar panels, for example, exactly that. Well, who can afford to put solar panels on their house? Who can afford to buy a Tesla or electric vehicle? Who can afford to build housing? Who can, who can right. afford, you know, I mean, the reality is, is it's all of the investment. Most of the investment comes from wealthy people. That's where the investment comes from. Well, if you're going to encourage that investment through tax incentives, I mean, that's, that's the biggest question, right? Should we use, should the government be manipulating the economy at all? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to uh, eliminate that, you would go to a flat tax and you would eliminate that completely. But I, I, I don't know about you. I don't see that happening in my grandchildren's lifetime, let alone mine. Yeah. I've also, I've also said too, that if it was really about recovering tax revenue, if that was truly the, the objective is we need to claw back more tax revenue. We need to, to, to change something very simple, get rid of the S corp. If they really wanted to, or one thing they could do is like, they really wanted to recover a ton of that, those self-employment taxes. For example, there are a couple of things that they could do that could actually make a difference in the tax revenue, but they won't. For a couple of reasons. One is they all have one. <laughs> all of Congress has at least a few. And I just think that that's not going to realistically happen. But I think that fundamentally, if it were really a question of we need more money, that there are ways that they could eliminate certain breaks, but they won't because they want to incentivize those behaviors. I, I, would, go, I, would, I would go the opposite direction, Shannon. I okay. would say eliminate the C-Corp. Oh, that too. Yeah, that's one example too. You know, w- yeah. when, when you really are complaining about the rates, you're t- talking about people who own are the CEOs and they own stock in the big companies and the big companies, they are absolutely using loopholes. They are using Cayman islands. They're using offshore. They're using the double Irish strategy, all these things that nobody else, you know, besides tax advisors have heard about, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they're using these. Okay. Well, guess what? They can do that because they're corporations and corporations can move. Yep. But if all the tax were paid by individuals, it would be much more difficult. So, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. You know, you, you say eliminate the S corp. I'm going eliminate the C corp. That's actually a better one. You're right. Eliminate the because, C corp. Because or- I think it's harder for an individual to avoid taxes than a corporation to avoid I, taxes. I agree. Much yeah. harder. Yeah, it's something that big that would have to happen, but it's just not going to happen. Like, yeah. not anytime soon. That's kind of the point. Is there are big changes they could make if they really wanted the money, but it's just not going to change. Yeah. Here, here's the other thing to think about though. Would it really generate more tax revenue? Um, if, if you look at, so one of the, one, one of the endorsements on my uh, recent book, Win Win Wealth Strategy was by Art Laffer, who is famous for the Laffer curve. He was Ronald Reagan's economic advisor. Mm-hmm. And he's the one who basically proposed what we now call Reaganomics, which is lower taxes, actually means higher revenue to the government. And if if you look at some of the tax changes, even in the Trump tax bill in 2017, they've actually raised revenue. 
And, and that's proven. They've actually raised revenue and people thought, well, it's going to lose all this money. Well, some of it does, but some of it actually raises revenue. The changes they made to the corporate tax law has actually increased revenue. And so, you know, this idea that higher ta tax rates mean more revenue, I think it's a fallacy. I mean, the reason we didn't get the change to the capital gains rates, right? That's the big question, right? Mm -hmm. You want people who own stock, you know, and businesses to pay more taxes, you increase the capital gains rate. Well, the reason it doesn't work is because once you get over that 20% threshold, which is where we are right now, you actually start changing behavior so much that you lose taxes. And so, I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's a, an absolute truth to say that raising taxes increases tax revenue. Sometimes lowering taxes increase tax revenue. And really, I think that's the whole that's the whole point behind my book, Win Win Wealth Strategy. Is look, you can see the government gives you an incentive, but they also take the back end of that, right? So if 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 they're saying, look, if you use your money to increase your business and improve your profits. That's what makes a, an expense deductible, right? It has right. to be necessary expense for increasing your profitability. If you do that, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna make more profit. If you make more profit, what are you gonna do? You're gonna pay more tax. And so it, it, it's actually a win for the government. It's, it, I don't think these tax incentives are automatically a net loser. There are some. Actually, 401 case, net loser to the government. That's a net loser to the government. 401ks, pension plans, IRAs, those are net losers, losers to the government. But real estate tax benefits, business tax benefits, uh, research development tax benefits, I don't think those are net losers. I think those are net winners. Yeah. What you're, what you're unpacking too is the, the downstream effect of these changes, not just the literal, what is it going to right. do? It's what is it going to do over time? And how is it going to change behavior? We get back to this behavior. How will that change behavior of citizens and, and how will that affect it? And again, to your point, CPAs have a big part in encouraging certain behaviors as well based on their understanding of the law. So with the sure. right advisor on your side, you can move in tune with what the incentives are. And that's what it's all about with tax planning and tax advisory, not about those few pieces of paper you get every year uh, in April. So it, it's so, so, so important to be thinking about this stuff year round, even if you're not an expert, but having somebody in your corner or at least seeking out education and having that curiosity to understand more about it. For sure. Tom, one more time, can you tell folks where they can find out more information about you, about your books, and where they can consume more content and education from you? Uh, wealthability.com is our website. And uh, that's where, you know, if you want a free, um, want us to look, want a second opinion on your tax return, you can go there. Tax-free wealth and win-win wealth strategy are both bestsellers. So it's easy to find those in a bookstore or Amazon or wherever, um, wherever books are sold, you're going to find those two books. They're, they're very well supplied and very well, very well known. And then I, I do have a podcast called The Wealth Ability Show, which uh, we, we talk about all things, fine, not just financial, but also business. And uh, so um, actually very little tax we talk about in the Wealth Ability Show, but a lot of financial and, and really broad based. How do you how do you improve your life? So um, those would probably be the best. Thank you for offering that. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to add one more plug, which is a show I love, which is the Wealth Ability for CPAs. And Thank so you. for my fellow accountants who are listening, because I know you're out there, I know you're listening. Uh, that is actually a really great show. I love your perspective because not enough people are out there preaching what you're preaching about how to have better clients and a better life as a result. Yes. And it is so, so good when it comes to understanding. And also if you're a client listening to this, because it will heighten your expectation of accountants and it will heighten True. what <laughs> you think you deserve in terms of a service provider. And it will awaken you to, are you in the right, right relationship? You know, are you, are you having that April 15th hookup or are you in the right relationship for the long term? And that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. Tom, thank you again for joining me on the show today. Thank you. Did you enjoy this episode, but want to explore more on this topic? Or maybe you have questions for me and our guests. One of the best parts of doing this podcast is interacting with you in the Keep What You Earn community. This community is a completely free resource for you to ask questions, chat about our episodes, and to connect with us on our monthly calls. Yes, all for free. We host this community on a platform called Circle, so you won't be bogged down by Facebook notifications or get your posts buried in the mix. So click the link in the show notes to join us in the community right now.
Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform. This small action goes a long way for podcasters to get our message heard by more business owners just like you. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to information about our guests and ways to get in touch with me. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.